Well, we are on a journey together, aren't we? A journey we've never seen before. Ah, praise the Lord. Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 3. Today was the day that I had intended on starting back in the Gospel of Mark. We went through chapters 1 and 2 and most of chapter 3 before we stopped meeting together. And then um, uh, when, I came, when we came back, I had a few topical messages I wanted to share last week. Just happened to end up in Mark, even though I was, um, we, we skipped a little bit, went into chapter 4 last week. So now we're going to go back to where we were. Um, before the pandemic struck. Mark chapter 3, verse, um, tw tw let's start at 20 and uh, f following. And this will be the text, by the way, for the next two Sundays. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he's out of his mind. My family said that about me before, too. So. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he binds, first binds the strong man then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading of this word, that the meditations of my heart, the expressions from my lips might be acceptable and pleasing to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. It's important when we study the Gospels, any of the four Gospels, that we pay attention not only to what they say, but to how they say what they say. These Gospels are not biographies, uh, and the Gospel writers give their message their way. Mark gives us what seems to be two stories here. He goes on further after um, that verse 30 and finishes up what he started in verses 20 and 21, talking about Jesus' family. Um, so he seems to mix these two stories together. It's like, you remember in, when they were first coming out with these flat screen TVs that, that weighed two tons, you know, each one. Like that one that was in your living room, Basil, you know. Uh, they used to have something called um, a picture-in-picture. Picture. You know, you could get a little picture of another channel in the corner while you watch the big picture. Am I dreaming that? Are y'all? Okay. Um, well, um, <clears throat> that's sort of what he's given um, today. We're going we're gonna to put the picture about Jesus' family, the, the, the first picture, about his family circle up in the corner. 
Uh, we're going to make the big picture his dealing with the scribes uh, at this time. And then next week we'll make the, what's the little picture today, the big picture. <laughs> well, that was, that was a, those are a lot of words to tell you nothing. Um, <clears throat> but they've, you know, uh, the, the, these are the religious people that, uh, of the day. Uh, the, verse 22, the scribes came down from Jerusalem. The religious folk of the day, there were, uh, it, it appears they were a, an official delegation um, sent from Jerusalem. They came to, to um, Galilee to uh, observe Jesus' ministry. Uh, they came to make an assessment of his ministry. And uh, because they, their opinion carried a lot of weight uh, with the people. Uh, William Lane, in his commentary, says, It is possible that they were official emissaries of the great Sanhedrin who came to examine Jesus' miracles and to determine whether Capernaum could be declared a seduced city, the prey of an apostate preacher. And one of their arguments, or the major argument that Mark mentions here, is that Jesus was exorcising demons by the power of the chief demon, Satan himself, that he was actually possessed. Um, he is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He cast out demons, Beelzebul, prior to this time um, uh, had meant several different things. But by the first century, Beelzebub was another term for Satan himself. And so they're saying Jesus is possessed and, and, um, and <laughs> sort of an underhanded compliment to Jesus. They didn't say he's, he's being possessed by a demon um, just one of the little underling demons, you know. They say he's being possessed by the chief of demons, Satan himself, which is uh, at least they're attributing some power <laughs> and glory to Jesus in all this, some greatness to him because of what's taking place. He's not just dealing with underlings, you know. He's... He's identifying with Satan himself. But that's not the case, as we know. And so Jesus responds. And his first response, he, he counters them there from, from 23 uh, through 26. He gives his rebuttal to them. He, he called them. He said, how can Satan cast out Satan? The, their criticism really didn't make any sense. Um, how could Satan drive out Satan? It, it was sort of a silly accusation in the first place. But they went with it, and Jesus took off with it too. He showed that if he were an uh, agent of Satan and was working against Satan, then obviously Satan was at a, in a civil war, a house against themselves. This was civil war, and, and that house would not stand. There's no way that Satan would work against Satan. No kingdom that's at war with itself can possibly stand. If he was uh, opposing himself, verse 26, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. But the one thing that was so very clear to Jesus and so many others was that the powers of darkness were still at work. He was still busy exercising demons. He still saw the powers of darkness working all around him. And most of the people that were there saw the powers of darkness working. And so Satan was alive and well. Satan was working full time.
as he is today. <coughs> What greater evidence do we have uh, that Satan's alive and well today than just reading the newspaper? <laughs> Second thing we see <clears throat> in Jesus' response here is that he provides, he, he provides the truth about his ministry. He tells them a parable. He, in a parable, he explains why he's there. It's a wonderful thing, verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. He explains what he's there to do. He pictures Satan's vi victims are those people he has kidnapped. Satan's possessions are those people that he has kidnapped. And he is the powerful, he's the strong man that Jesus is talking about here. And so how are those possessions of Satan to be taken back from him? How are they to be rescued and, and given to their rightful own owner? And Jesus says, only if somebody stronger comes into the strong man's house ties him up and rescues those possessions. See that? Verse 27, plunder his goods unless he first binds him the strong man. Then he may indeed plunder his house. Tie him up and plunder the devil's house. But it's got to be somebody stronger than him. And so in this parable, Satan is the strong man who guards what belongs to him. Jesus' ministry, the reason Jesus is here, is defeating him permanently and rescuing those that he has in his grasp. So Jesus answers this charge about being in league with the devil. He said, I'm not under Satan because I'm stronger than he is. He looked at every single life. I could see him looking around during this encounter. He looked at every life that he had delivered from Satan's grasp, and he says, I'm plundering the kingdom of Satan one life at a time. That's why I'm here. The one who binds the strong man and who plunders his house is the risen Lord and Savior Jesus. And that's what he came to do. He came to destroy the power and influence of Satan himself and, and, and his control on people's lives and, and his, his, his desire to destroy life. And Jesus came to bring them back to fellowship with God, to reconcile them to God. He's coming to Satan's house, the world. The New Testament uh, calls Satan the prince of the world in his ministry and on the cross and through the resurrection. He would overcome Satan. He would liberate his people. He would set them free. That was the true meaning of every, all those exorcisms. We've seen them all through these first three chapters of Mark. That's the true meaning of all the exorcisms that they were going on at the, at the time. And, and, and the religious people of the day couldn't see it. They couldn't see what was happening. Let's not miss what's happening around us. And then the third thing we see is that Jesus followed his teaching with some application. Verse 28 and 29, truly I say to you, 
All sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an e eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. There's no sin that puts anybody beyond forgiveness, he says. It doesn't matter what blasphemy you may be involved in, you can't be forgiven except for one. There's only one sin where there's no forgiveness, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, this statement has been questioned by so many of us, and it's confused so many people and troubled so many people. People worry about their salvation. Have I committed the unpardonable sin? It's an important question to ask, I think. Mark gives us a, a, at least a piece of an explanation, a partial explanation here, the, because the, he, he closes this out by the religious leaders were saying he has an unclean spirit. Here is one certain sign that a man or woman is in danger of committing the unforgiven sin, the unpardonable sin, a stubborn resistance and refusal of Jesus that these scribes were doing at this time. And it's revealed in treating him like he's the ultimate enemy. He has an unclean spirit. Treating Jesus Christ as your ultimate enemy enemy because the Holy Spirit is bringing you under conviction is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Let's take it a bit further because I don't want you to miss this. It is the sin today when one considers that conversion to Jesus Christ or obedience to Christ as Lord and Savior is the ultimate waste. It's, it, it's, it's even deeper than saying following Jesus is folly. It's considering it as, as, as conversion is the ultimate waste of life. And this is what we're seeing in this passage as well as seeing in the lives of so many people that you meet day in and day out. A willful blindness to Christ, a hardness of heart against him. Now, I answer that question when people ask me uh, most of the time, it's, uh, and maybe it's not the best answer sometimes, but... The, the frequent answer is that if you're anxious that you've committed the, you've, you're living a life, you're living a fruitful life, you're anxious that you've committed the unpardonable sin and that you're not saved, well, just that anxiety might be a pretty good example that you are. Because... Anybody that would consider conversion to Jesus Christ an ultimate waste would not be under conviction about it. They'd throw it off. But on the other side, uh, it can be dangerous presuming that completely. Oh, I'm worried. I'm worried, so I haven't committed the unpardonable sin. So that I haven't committed the unpardonable sin. So I must be saved. Which means, okay, I haven't committed the unpardonable sin. I am saved, so now I can keep living like hell. That's the other side 
That's the other danger with this as well. That's why I said at the very beginning, it's not a bad question to ask. I think, too, it's good to understand what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is by understanding what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is all about. Jesus said in, in uh, John chapter 16, uh, uh, and this is not on the screen, he said, when he has come, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then John 15, and he will testify of me. You understand the work of the Holy Spirit as a believer, it's so very hard to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. These religious leaders were in danger of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because they looked at the perfectly good and wonderful work of God in Jesus Christ and officially pronounced it the evil of Satan. That's the best picture of what Jesus is talking about here when he says the unpardonable sin. What the religious leaders were in danger of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because they looked at the perfectly good and wonderful work of God in Jesus and officially pronounced it the evil of Satan. Ray Steadman said, Notice that these men had not yet committed the unpardonable sin. Otherwise, Jesus would have never warned them. By his own words, there is no use warning a man who has committed the unpardonable sin. He's beyond help. So when we persistently reject the work the Holy Spirit wants to do in us, and when we have a continued, settled rejection of what He tells us about Jesus Christ, then we blaspheme the Holy Spirit. H.A. Ironside, this comfort for us all, H.A. Ironside said, these words were never intended to torment anxious souls honestly desiring to know Christ. But they stand out as a blazing beacon, warning of the danger of persisting in the rejection of the Spirit's testimony of Christ until the seared conscience no longer responds to the gospel message. Friends, God can forgive all sins. God could, he could, he could forgive the sin that Jesus calls the unpardonable sin, but he limits himself in this, this one sin, because if he were to forgive it, he wouldn't be God, and he wouldn't be perfectly just. You may be continually rejecting Christ and using the church as a crutch. You may be that person rejecting the Holy Spirit, use the church as a crutch. Mark shows us in his gospel more than once, and we're only at chapter 3. He shows us that the greatest of sins are often those of the most religious of people. He underlines for us the basic lesson that is not religion or church, but Jesus who saves. So you may be continually rejecting Christ and using church as a crutch. That's a good question to consider. You may be continually rejecting Christ and using your Christian upbringing as a crutch. Hey, 
you can, you can still blaspheme the Holy Spirit and play the church game at the same time. People, some people are really, really good at that. And because you may be using the church as a crutch, and because you may be using your Christian upbringing as a crutch or some other thing, don't go beyond this day without dealing with this in your heart. He's calling you to himself. There's no work you can do. There's no act you can commit to even make that salvation happen. The only thing you can do is run to Jesus. And do it quickly. Let's pray.